Hi, this is uh, Dave Turk from the IEA. We'll go ahead and get started with our digitalization and energy webinar. First, a welcome and a good afternoon, good morning or good evening, depending on where you're at around in the world. Um, from Paris, um, where we give you a warm welcome, although we have uh, five inches or so of snow on the ground outside here. Um, so it's a bit cold outside, but a warm welcome from all of us around the table. Um, and we do have a lot of folks on um, the webinar today, 40 countries represented from all regions, Europe, Africa, Middle East, Americas, and Asia. So welcome wherever you're uh, participating from on this webinar. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to join us on this webinar for a first ever report from the IEA on digitalization and energy. Now at the IEA, um, covering all energy, all technologies, all fuels, we focused on digitalization's impact on the energy sector for many, many years. For instance, in 2011, we released our first smart grid roadmap. We've also been tracking electric vehicles and smart charging and analyzing the network standby uh, energy use. But we thought it quite helpful to take a step back and not just look at digitalization's impact in specific energy sectors, but to look at the entire digitalization phenomena and the energy landscape as a whole, to make sure we were seeing the entire forest and not just the individual trees. That's why our executive director, Fatih Birol, called a number of us together across the IEA, all parts of the IEA, our modelers, our efficiency folks, renewables, oil and gas experts, power experts, statisticians, statisticians security professionals, and so on, all together to form a cross-cutting IEA digitalization and energy working group and to put together the report that we're going to present the webinar on today on digitalization and energy. Over the last year, this group of dozens of us at the IEA have been holding workshops, meeting with experts from around the world, experts from the government side, from industry side, and a variety of other um, stakeholders to really try to get our heads around and get an understanding of this rapidly evolving and exciting uh, topic and phenomenon. We hope that this first ever report and the analysis in it of digitalization and energy will help all decision makers throughout the world, whether from government and business, to better navigate this rapidly changing landscape. And we also see this very much as a springboard for some additional analysis from the IEA side of things, but from others um, as well. So without further ado, let me turn it over to George, who can introduce us to the topic and guide us through the rest of the webinar. And each of our key experts will take us through um, specific impacts of digitalization on a variety of different uh, sectors. Over to you, George. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, so I'm just going to introduce um, digital technologies and some of the, the trends we're seeing uh, in digitalization. Um, so as we know, in our day-to-day -day lives, um, digital technologies are all around us, uh, changing how we use energy, and we're expecting these to have even greater impacts into the future. So I'm just going to illustrate this with one example, uh, which is hailing a ride through your smartphone, uh, which is happening about 15 million times a day globally already. The fact that new mobility mo models like Lyft and Uber are only possible with faster mobile broadband networks that allow us to connect with an ever-increasing portion of the world, and the ubiquity of smartphones. There are now more smartphones than there are, there are more, now more active mobile phones than there are people in the world, and we have about 4 billion smartphones already, a tripling over the past five years, with huge increases in the developing world. And once you click that you want to ride, uh, data networks and GPS technologies pinpoint your location and that of nearby drivers. Artificial intelligence then helps you match, you match you up with the driver and maybe other passengers along the way if you want to take a carpool. Once the driver picks you up, AI uses real-time traffic data collected from road sensors and other users to provide step-by-step -step directions to efficiently get to where you're going. And in the not so distant future, we're expecting digital technologies to increasingly uh, integrate higher numbers of EVs on the road and that can participate in smart charging. That is using big data analytics and machine learning to predict, integrate, and match your driver's energy demand uh, to power up his electric vehicle with the supply from intermittent renewables like wind and solar. And perhaps in the closer than you think future, the, the car that'll pick you up might not even have a driver at all. 
And this is just one example of how digitalization is shaping our future. And all of these examples individually and together can have a huge impact on how we use and supply energy. So what are the key drivers of digitalization? Well, it's really about advances in the three areas of data, analytics, and connectivity. Uh, we're seeing cheaper sensors, cheaper and faster data transmission, and huge advances in AI and machine learning. In the energy sector, we've seen some impressive cost reductions in clean energy technologies over the past 10 years. In the graph, you'll just see two examples, um, electric vehicle batteries and so utility scale PV, which have declined by seven, over 70% and 80% respectively since 2008. In contrast, we see cost reductions in digital technologies that are even more impressive. For example, the cost of sensors has dropped by over 90% over the last 10 years. Now let's look at one example of some of the astonishing digital trends we're seeing, internet data traffic. In just a few relatively short years, we've gone from a dot you can barely see on the left in 1987 uh, to one that can't even fit on the slide, having to use new terms like zettabytes, which is one with 21 zeros after it, or one trillion gigabytes equivalent to 250 billion DVDs. Over the past five years alone, we've seen internet traffic more than triple. The internet, like electricity, uh, we, we see here on this map in yellow uh, for the grid, relies on physical infrastructure and assets, be it long haul fiber optic cables and at the bottom of our oceans that you can see in purple, wireless towers and routers, data centers and servers, and smartphones and other connected devices, all of which use energy. And as the number of devices and the volume of internet traffic grows exponentially, so too will the demand for data center and network services. In the report, we show our latest analysis on electricity use in data centers and networks. And the news is largely reassuring, at least for the near term. Starting with data centers, we estimate that currently they account for about 1% of global electricity use. And despite a tripling of demand for data center workloads to 2020, we're expecting only a 3% increase in electricity demand to about 200 terawatt hours. There are two main drivers for, this efficiency gain, uh, for these efficiency gains. First, the continued improvements and efficiency of servers, drivers, and data center infrastructure like cooling and lighting. And second, we can see in this graph, the shift away from smaller inefficient data centers towards much larger and more efficient cloud and hyperscale data centers that we see in turquoise and green. The report also includes a case study in India where we show that the important role that best practices could have in reducing energy demand in rapidly growing emerging markets like India which we could estimate be, could be a 15% reduction in energy demand compared to business as usual. And the use of AI could further improve efficiency as well. Google has used DeepMind machine learning to reduce cooling energy use by 40% in one of their most efficient data centers. As large energy users and to reduce their environmental footprint, big ICD companies operating cloud and hyperscale data centers like Google, Microsoft, and Apple are also increasingly investing in energy, especially renewables. In fact, these companies accounted for more than half of total corporate power purchase agreements for renewables over the past two years. And on to data networks. They're consuming about 1% of global electricity demand overall as well, with mobile networks accounting for about two thirds of the total. Future trends, even over the next few years, are very difficult to predict, hinging largely on what we assume uh, to be efficiency gains. For example, under a moderate rate of efficiency improvement, we could see a 70% uh, increase in total electricity use, while if efficiency gains accelerate, overall electricity demand for networks could actually decrease by 15%. Given the rapid pace of technological change, providing credible forecasts of IT, ICT energy use beyond the next five years is very challenging. And we're, over the longer term, we're seeing the, the continued battle between data demand growth and the continuation of efficiency improvements. So before we get on to uh, the impacts of digitalization on energy demand and supply sectors, uh, we have a, a poll to share with you to, to get your views. 
Uh, let me just pull this up. So you should see a poll on your screen now. Uh, the question is, which sector do you think will be most impacted or transformed by digitalization over the next five to 10 years? Um, is it buildings? Is it transport? Industry? Oil and gas? Uh, coal or power? And I'll, I'll give a, a few seconds for you to respond to this. Um, all right, so the results are 17% um, for buildings, 29% for transport. Um, you also see a very high number for power at 31%. Um, so I'll turn it over to the experts uh, who will now, uh, now speak about the impacts on different sectors, um, starting with uh, Thibaut Aberzel from our energy technology perspective. Thank you very much. In buildings, digitalization will create tremendous opportunities for new businesses and climate change mitigation strategies. It will impact the sector in different ways, the first one being reducing global building energy demand. It can be done by improving the irresponsiveness of energy services through occupancy sensors, for example, or daylighting sensors, but also, also through enhanced prediction of user needs through a dashboard or through learning algorithms that can auto program heating and cooling uh, on their own. Altogether, that's 65 gigawatt hour of cumulative energy that can be saved to 2040, or 10% of building energy demand. So that's a big deal. Although most of building energy is consumed in the residential sector, most of the savings are expected to be achieved in the non residential sector. sector. The reason for that is that end use patterns are more predictable in this sector and that building operators are more prone to use advanced technologies faster. A second terrific impact of dig digitalization would be enabling, enabling demand-side response. Actually, the biggest potential for demand-side management lies in the building sector. How could this be achieved? Through shifting the use the time of use of a washing machine, for example, or through shedding loads by adjusting temperature settings to lower energy demand at a particular time. Adjust, adjusting, adjusting energy use can be also done with response to real-time energy prices through flexible products such as refrigerators, ACs, or hot water heaters, or even through thermal grids in response to real-time energy prices. This graph shows the growth of network-enabled devices, and we see that although it represents today a very minor part of total appliance consumption, it will be more than half of total appliance consumption in 2040. So this growth is an opportunity to scale up demand-side response. It will create benefits for both the consumer and the utility. The consumer will enjoy more diversified energy services, including thermal comfort and greater resilience, but it can also be rewarded financially for not using energy at a particular moment. Naturally, this is also a great opportunity for utilities that can offer modern energy services to innovative business models. This digitalization has many other impacts, including on energy efficiency deployment. Measuring, reporting, and monitoring will be easier with real-time real -time data that can consume, that can measure really the, the actual energy consumption of products. We can also identify where and when maintenance is needed uh, and which device does not perform as expected. It also broadens broaden our horizons with new services such as Li-Fi, Light Fidelity. I don't, I don't know if you've heard of it before. It's basically a means to communicate through the light. So Li-Fi modulates a lighting signal, creating an envelope over the, over the light signals, and it creates enhanced energy services and basically the ability to communicate through light. Uh, it has already a lot of applications in the supermarkets, for example, through location services, but also for payment services. So we can imagine a future when we could pay 
through through the light uh, based on simply lampposts on the street. There are barriers to, to digitalization in buildings. Interoperability uh, is one of them. As products and, uh, and meters are diverse, the granularity could be an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, finally, education, training, and communication is key to ensure that all of these <coughs> products are interoperable and that standby power does not offset the potential savings from digitalization. So this was an overview of buildings. Now let's move to transport with Jacob Peter. Jacob, it's up to you. Thanks a lot, Thibault. Um, in the transport sector, digital technologies have long been and their supporting infrastructure to make transport systems safer and more efficient. Existing systems go by the name Intelligent Transportation Systems, or ITS. This term of art actually covers a wide range of technologies. It includes sensors, communication systems, advanced analytics, and these have a similarly wide range of applications from improving operations, safety, efficiency, and service to reducing costs. Um, everyday examples of ITS include things like in-road traffic uh, detectors to control traffic lights, radio frequency identification to automatically collect tolls, and using global positioning systems, GPS, and telecommunications for routing and roadside assistance. The three main trends shaping the future of ITS are connectivity, shared mobility, and automation. While we see these technologies being applied across all modes of transport, we may see some of the biggest changes in the road transport sector. And in road transport, the economic signals for change are strongest and the barriers to adoption lowest in road freight highway operations. One reason for this is that fuel and labor collectively make up the majority of operational costs for truck fleets. This translates to strong economic incentives for businesses to adopt cost savings enabled by digitalization. A wide range of options exist, both operational and technological. Operational improvements that are already available, though not necessarily as widely adopted as they could be, include things like optimized real-time routing and monitoring of cargo to increase truck loads, and something called digital freight matching, which is, which is essentially Uber for trucks. Um, and which is pro proliferating, for example, in China's uh, road freight sector today. Technical improvements also already improve safety and real-world fuel efficiency of trucks. Think, for instance, of how cruise control and lane keeping make heavy-duty trucks driving on highways safer. In, re in recent years, we've also seen more and more demonstration projects of both vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle connectivity and automation in trucks. Um, platooning demonstrations where a convoy of trucks can safely travel very close together to reduce uh, aerodynamic drag and thereby improve fuel efficiency have demonstrated a potential to reduce, reduce fuel consumption by about 15% in cases where the gaps between trucks are close to as little as four meters. Also, since highways constitute a relatively predictable and stable, stable driving environment compared with urban uh, roads, Introducing some degree of vehicle autonomy, um, limited vehicle autonomy, what's called level three vehicle autom autonomy, is relatively simple and has already been demonstrated on roads, uh, for instance, in the US and Europe, to be technically viable today. So higher levels of autonomy are likely, are likely to diffuse earliest across highway operations of regional and long haul truck deliveries. We estimate that the digitalization of trucks and logistics overall could reduce energy use by 20 to 25 percent through these and other digitally, digitally enabled operational and technological measures. Um, for more details on these kind of measures that could be adopted in road freight, uh, I would like to refer you to our recent report, uh, The Future of Trucks. The impact of digitalization could also be transformative in personal mobility, where the combination of automation sharing and electrification could change dramatically how we get around. We are already beginning to see a limited shift from conventional car ownership to mobility services in cities across the globe, with smartphone apps uh, that George discussed in the opening, enabling new app-based ride-hailing mobility services, some of which are cheaper if the rides are shared, 
So you have not only Uber and Lyft and their shared variant Uber Pool and Lyft Line for cars, but you also have things like dockless bike sharing, which recently exploded onto the urban landscape in China, and even more recently has been exported with mixed success and to mixed reviews to some European and North American cities. If self-driving cars were to become a market reality, they could transform the business models for ride hailing and other mobility services. While more basic automated technologies like parking assistance are already available today, we are likely to still at least be a decade away from being able to drive full, to, to ride in fully driverless cars. Auto and tech companies are investing huge amounts of money into autonomous vehicle technologies, but there are not only technology hurdles that remain to be overcome, but also still many regulatory and policy questions around liability, interoperability, and cybersecurity that need to be addressed before we can see these cars widely deployed. On top of these uncertainties, it's difficult to predict how people will use these technologies, making estimating the energy impacts of autom auto automation and sharing extremely difficult. While some work has been done to estimate the lower and upper bounds of potential energy impacts, this range is still quite wide. In an optimistic scenario, the one you see in the middle of this slide, automation and sharing could help cut road transport energy demand in the U.S. in half through improved efficiencies like optimizing traffic flow via, via vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and vehicle right sizing, i.e. matching the size of a car to the user's needs. But automation could also result in huge rebound effects, which you see on the right side of this slide, resulting in much more travel activity and potentially a doubling of energy use in a very pessimistic scenario. Policy will be an will play an important role to steer these developments towards a more sustainable mobility future. The IEA will soon be embarking on a project to examine not only the potential for increased car activity and the resultant impacts on vehicle energy use and emissions, but also to explore the impacts on urban space, public transit, walking and biking, and potential synergies between electric vehicles, EVs, and automated vehicles, AVs. And now I pass the floor off to Kira West, who will uh, talk about the impacts in industry. Thanks, Jacob. Um, the industrial sector already has quite a long history of using digital technology, particularly to improve safety and increase production via automation. And while digitalization is well underway in some industrial sectors, uh, one estimate putting the total number of industrial robots worldwide in 2015 at about 1.6 million, there's still potential for further digitalization in the sector. In the near term, we see this as largely an incremental uh, progress, but there are still possibilities for disruptive digital developments in the industrial sector. So today I'm going to highlight a couple of examples that we've looked at in the report of um, digital applications of digital technology in the industrial sector that, that could have an impact on uh, energy use in industry in the coming years. Uh, first, looking at industrial process controls. Uh, the current extent of digitalization in industrial process control varies quite widely across industry, uh, but improving process control via digital technology can lead to cost-effective energy savings. So here we see uh, the, the uh, results of an audit funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and undertaken by industrial assessment centers. And this is an example of how digital meters and sensors can collect data on system performance, which can then be either optimized, controlled and optimized by human operators or by automated digital systems and to determine an optimal response to both everyday fluctuations in operating parameters or to emergency events and disruptions. This can also um, help provide predictive maintenance by identifying and diagnosing system inefficiencies in an industrial site. Uh, next, I'd like to look at 3D printing, also sometimes called additive manufacturing. Uh, here we have a case study of potential uh, material and energy savings from aircraft component lightweighting using 3D printing. 3D printing can be used to make aircraft lighter, both by reducing the materials to build the plane and the fuel to fly it. So here we can see 
a huge difference between the amount of metal needed for conventional component manufacturing compared to 3D printing on the right. A difference of over 20,000 tons of metal per year by 2050. And on the right, we can see that a rapid adoption of 3D printing in aircraft manufacturing could save over 1.5 billion gigajoules of fuel, equivalent to three quarters of the current annual fuel use for domestic aviation in the US if this was rapidly adopted in the US. And uh, finally, I'd also like to look at uh, digital plant twins. Digital plant twins are virtual replicas of industrial equipment or industrial sites, which allow virtual feasibility and durability testing of real process plants and can both accelerate the innovation cycle by saving time and resources and can contribute to predictive maintenance as well. Uh, preventing equipment failure via predictive maintenance um, beyond clear safety and economic benefits can also have a positive impact on energy consumption in industry as it avoids or significantly reduces equipment downtime and the duration of startup and shutdown periods, which are typically more energy intensive periods for an industrial facility as the plant is not operating at its optimum load. So these are a couple of examples of, of digital technology applications in the industrial sector. It's not exhaustive, but these, these particular applications can, could have quite important impacts on the energy consumption of the industrial sector in the years to come. So now I think we'll move to the energy supply sectors and I'll pass to my colleague, Christoph. Thanks very much. So I'm gonna start by discussing some of the impacts, potential impacts that digitalization could have on the oil and gas sector. But I think beforehand, it's, it's worth pointing out that the oil and gas industry has quite a complicated relationship with, with digital technologies. On the one hand, oil and gas companies are well accustomed to pushing the boundaries of, of technology. We can think about uh, hydraulic fracturing in the United States, think about ultra deep water drilling in a number of uh, countries around the world. And many companies have expressed interest in adapting new digital technologies as they become available. But on the other hand, the industry's capital intensive nature and the high level of operational hazards that are involved in oil and gas projects have created a somewhat conservative management cult culture that can often slow down the adoption of new technologies if they become available. So for example, if we look at large upstream oil and gas projects, these can typically take many years to develop. And often once a project has been designed and sanctioned, the focus of, of companies is on good execution of the project rather than continuously implementing new design changes. And therefore, even though digital technologies evolve very quickly, the nature of project management within the oil and gas industry often means that new te digital technologies can get left behind. Nevertheless, there are multiple new digital technologies that could have an impact on the sector. And some of the examples are, are shown on, on, this, on the slide here. And just to highlight one of these, one of those promising opportunities that it could be for the oil and gas sector is the use of big data to help enhance geological understanding of a reservoir and to allow real-time monitoring of what's going on in the subsurface once a well has been drilled. I want to go through four specific ways in which the more widespread use of digital technologies and potential adoption of new and future digital technologies could aid the supply of oil and gas. So first of all, we could look at increasing the overall resource space for oil and gas. What we can see here is that the, is the current resources of oil and gas split, split globally between conventional and unconventional sources of production and split between oil and gas. There's around about 1.4 trillion tons of oil equivalent that we currently think can be extracted. And just to note that today we, we consume around 7.5 billion tons of, of, of oil equivalent. And so there's an awful lot of oil and gas left in the world that can be extracted. But nevertheless, through the widespread use of existing and emerging digital technologies, such as, for example, the enhanced processing of seismic data, if these were to be applied across the entire global resource base, we estimate that the amount of oil and gas could be extracted could be increased by up to 75 billion tons of oil equivalent. This is an increase of around about 5% and would be equivalent to uh, increasing the amount of oil and gas we can uh, produce 
by around about 10 years at current levels. But it's important to note that the impact of digitalization will vary uh, across the different resources in question. And its potential to boost recoverable resources is likely to be largest for tight oil and shale gas resources, where the time between when investment decisions are made and when the projects are actually executed are much shorter. And I should just note that in this figure, the overall increase that we see for unconventional oil, which would include uh, tight oil, is actually only around about 3% because tight oil represents only a fraction of the unconventional oil resources. Other sources of unconventional oil, such as extra heavy oil in Venezuela, bitumen in Canada, and kerogen oil in the United States, that can compose the largest share of unconventional oil, are unlikely to benefit much from the enhanced use of digital technologies. But arguably a bigger impact of digitalization would be on decreasing production costs. For example, the use of in-well sensors could help us to understand in real time what is happening below the surface. And if data can be analyzed rapidly, this can lead to faster decisions being made in the field and increase the operating time of drilling rigs and wells. This can help to reduce delays when executing new projects and also in enhance uh, operating times. And we estimate that if these new technologies were to be adopted widely, then this could lead to a reduction in the cost of producing oil and gas by around about 10 to 20% over the long term. And the third point is on improving safety. Upstream projects, as I mentioned before, are often executed in very harsh climates. And the use of robotics to inspect and repair substrate infrastructure and to monitor transmission pipelines and tanks would avoid people needing to go into these hazardous environments and could improve overall safety levels for oil and gas companies. And finally, digitalization could help improve the detection, measurement, and abatement of methane emissions that are caused by oil and gas operations. The 2017 World Energy Outlook looked into this issue in, in, a, in some detail, and one of the, the findings of this was that there is a real need for new technologies and systems that can provide effective monitoring of methane emissions and quantify methane emissions at low cost. Digital technologies can help here, either by lowering the direct cost of detection or by helping to understand base, uh, better data that is collected. And with that, I will hand it over. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And Carlos Fernandez, I will, <clears throat> I will talk, uh, I will say a few words on, on code. Uh, I mean, I know it's uh, probably the most, uh, the, it, among the energy sources is the, the that one that where it's the most difficult to to imagine the application of uh, digitalization and digital technologies but as as any other uh, sector uh, coal industry uses the the best uh, technologies available and, and when these are digital opportunities are, are applied so there are multiple opportunities uh, throughout the the supply chain for example and drilling and blasting uh, operations that uh, are needed to, to do uh, before starting uh, the surface operations uh, can be optimized uh, through application of uh, digital uh, technologies. I mean, stripping coal, removing our burden, optimization, optimization of uh, processes can uh, improve uh, substantially with the uh, application of digital technologies. Transportation is where probably uh, techno uh, digital technologies have been uh, mostly applied uh, so far in, in the in the coal sector and my colleague uh, has already talked about the uh, how transportation can be uh, uh, improved so uh, transport uh, coal is not different from from transport uh, other goods and uh, also the operation also of uh, load uh, ships uh, uh, download the uh, trains all this can be uh, optimized through through the use of uh, digital, uh, digital technologies and in order to give uh, an example, uh, I, I bring this example because I think it's a real life uh, example. It's very illustrative because it's one of the simplest uh, operations in mining. So it's just the uh, uh, operator in the shovel that has to uh, uh, fill the, the uh, track before the you know the content of the track is is dumping. Uh, through, uh, this is, uh, as I said, it's a real uh, life uh, project and without the use of uh, drones and sensors in order to improve uh, you know, how the, the cycles are, are done and, and, and improving the, the degree of uh, the full of, of the vault shovel and, and the tracks, uh, the cost of this operation has been optimized in, in this example 
by around 20%. So this is a very simple example, but illustrates how uh, uh, sensor data processing uh, drones can uh, optimize the, the, all the, the processes in, in, in coal mining. Finally, yes, the same, the same comment that Chris made on oil and gas and safety is, is something that uh, will improve a lot. Uh, coal mining because of uh, the inherent uh, uh, characteristics of, of the operation, both the uh, presence of methane, the, the, the uh, roof collapse and so on, is still a very hazardous uh, operation. And with uh, uh, using uh, remote operations, uh, can, can, we can design and, and there are some projects, uh, to, some pilots uh, to have this uh, in operation soon, to have uh, miners, uh, sorry, mines without uh, miners. So this will reduce uh, uh, accidents and, and, and death toll uh, significantly. Uh, last but not least, uh, about the impact of digitalization in, in, on jobs. Uh, indeed, it will be an impact. But uh, I mean, if we go if we go back in time, uh, many jobs in mining were removed uh, in, in, in surface operation because of the use of large or very large uh, equipment. In the underground uh, mining, because of the mechanization of the of the task, uh, and so uh, we think that uh, digitalization will change the nature of jobs. So they will remove uh, people from the mines, but these uh, jobs will be offset by by IT jobs uh, outside the mines. So we don't think that uh, digitalization is going to have uh, the, such an impact to jobs as uh, as I said, the use of the uh, large machinery of, of mechanization has had uh, in the past. And with this, I will pass the baton to my colleague, uh, Brent, to continue with the uh, impact of digitalization in the power sector. Great. Thanks very much, Carlos. Uh, so I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, focusing on the work we did around uh, digitalization in the power sector, uh, which has many effects. And so to, uh, to aid in the analysis uh, and part Part of the structure for for the report, the effects into two pieces. Both on one side, how data and analytics uh, applied in existing power systems can impact the overall uh, the overall power sector, and then also uh, my colleague Luis after me will will focus on some of the broader changes that can come about from digitalization through enhanced connectivity. So on the data and analytics side, there's one key term that uh, to understand that enables and leads to many of the benefits uh, and changes in the system that arise from digitalization, and that's predictive maintenance. This was mentioned by my colleague Kira uh, on the industry side because there are simil similar applications there. Um, so I just want to say a few words about that as it's a, a core concept. So first off, it's based on digital sensors and the availability of low-cost sensors. We've seen the cost come down for basic digital sensors come down by 90% or more than 90% since 2010. It's deploying these sensors all throughout uh, power plants and network infrastructure, which enables the delivery of real-time information on the conditions and the operating conditions in those uh, in that infrastructure. So this enables monitoring of the situation and enables real-time action and interventions. The aim of that overall is to limit the stress on power plants and limit the stress on network infrastructure, and this leads to several key benefits. This can reduce overall operation and maintenance costs. This can improve the efficiency of power plants and networks. This can reduce the unplanned outages that result from these excessive stresses in the system and improve system stability. These can also extend the asset lifetimes, both for power plants again and the network infrastructure uh, as the stresses are reduced throughout their lifetime. This is the point where digital technology is being deployed. Uh, it matters when they're deployed during the lifetime of the plant or the, or the network. Um, so if we apply to existing infrastructure, we'll have uh, less of an impact on extending the lifetime, for example, uh, than if it's deployed in the original design of, of a power plant or network. 
and also improve system planning. We can see that the availability of real-time information of operations uh, and simulations can enable better design of the overall system, so uh, improving investment plans of, of where that investment would really be strategic and be critical for the operations. But also we can see that uh, digital information can enable the improved design of power plants themselves. For example, wind parks, the placement of wind turbine, turbines to optimize the overall output flow. Now here on the slide, you also see some of the benefits that, that derive from this. Uh, from on the left, reduced fuel consumption and cost to lower CO2 emissions, to improve system stability and reliability, reduced investment needs. Um, and the colors here, those shaded, indicate where those benefits accrue. So you have uh, benefits that accrue directly to the asset owner, marked in green, those that uh, apply and deliver benefits to the overall system and consumers, marked in red. And this is a point to highlight that you see benefits across the board to consumers from all of these elements. And you also have global environmental benefits uh, mentioned as the, the fuel, lower fuel consumption uh, through lower uh, pollutant emissions, and you also have lower CO2 emissions. So in the report and in the analysis, we also tried to estimate the, the impact overall uh, to quantify the impact uh, of what digitalization in the current system might mean. So you have two particular elements is that you can reduce the operating expenditures of the current system uh, through both lower operation and maintenance costs and improving the efficiency, as I mentioned. And you can also reduce the capital expenditures by uh, extending the life of existing power plants and network infrastructure, but also those new that would be built. Uh, and this is based on the, the most recent literature, which is rapidly evolving uh, and uh, moving forward at what the potential benefit. So if you look in, in the total, you see that this could save about $80 billion per year in overall power generation costs, uh, which is about 5% of the total annual power generation costs today. Uh, and so we see that this is, this is good for consumers. This is less uh, lower cost for them overall. This is also an opportunity to improve the financial health of the power sector and improve the overall stability and security of electricity. So, and that's all within power systems as they're designed and operated today. But digitalization could also lead to the reshaping of the overall power sector and rethinking of those operations. And for more on this, I'll pass to my colleague, Luis. Thank you. Thanks, friend. Um, so to set up the, this uh, section on some of the broader system impacts, we thought we'd start with a question as well. Um, so I start by asking if every car uh, that's on the road today, if we turn that immediately into an electric vehicle, how much uh, do we think that electricity demand will increase? Um, so would it be doubled? So would it increase by 110%? Increase more by 50% or more than by 12%? The answer to that is in fact 12%. Uh, so every car on the road suddenly turns into an EV. The global demand for electricity increased by only, I would say, 12%. We look at how much uh, generation capacity would increase, so the generation needed to, to meet peak demand in this case, um, if everyone charged when it was best for them and not when it was best for the overall system, how much would that have to increase? So would it be again 12%, like in the case of electricity demand, closer to 40% or 20%? And the answer for that is actually 20%, so it's double uh, the increase in electricity demand, nearly double. So this means that the demand from technologies like EVs will need uh, a lot smarter management uh, of how, how uh, that demand is, is actually met, how it's delivered. Uh, and for that, digital technologies can, can help a great deal. So in the previous, as, as my colleague Brian mentioned earlier, in the previous uh, uh, slides, we have covered uh, the impacts of uh, digitalization on individual sectors. And while those are really important, really significant, as we have seen, there's also some maybe deeper, more transformational impacts that can be seen from the integration, from the interconnection of different sectors that is enabled by, by digital technology. So if we look at how the classical traditional energy system has been, has been built out, um, we see that it's mostly defined by one-way flows from large, mostly centralized power plants, 
uh, through transmission and distribution uh, networks to transport networks and then towards consumers that were mostly passive. They weren't uh, reacting in, in real time to what was happening elsewhere in the system, to what was happening further upstream on the, on the supply side. However, when we look at uh, the kind of system that digital technologies would, would enable, um, we see that this uh, would be a much more multi-directional, more distributed, more integrated system. Early in the presentation, we have seen how cost reductions in distributed energy resources, particularly PV and storage, are enabling a lot more deployment of, of, of these technologies. Distributed resources includes also um, new uh, grid designs like microgrids, mini-grids, and so on. New technologies like EVs that can also be a resource for the system. Uh, and this future energy system, aided by digital technologies, needs to enable their, their integration. Also, digital technologies, they enable an active demand side, uh, where consumers in homes, in businesses, and also in industries, they can actively participate in the operations of the, of the energy system. This kind of system, it needs to have a lot more, and it needs to provide a lot more flexibility from both the demand and the supply side. So to illustrate this, I will start with an example um, of um, what it would look like in terms of overall flexibility for the system. So if we, st we start with, say, a medium-sized country, um, more or less what would happen in over a typical 48 hours in, over the summer. Um, and what we see, uh, if we add on top of the system demand, this is the, the, the instantaneous electricity demand in the system, but we see if we add a demand profile that is uncontrolled, so maybe this could be something you see below there, the profile of a charging electric vehicle, or perhaps some cooling system or some heating system in the winter uh, that's electrified. And we add that on top of the, with no control of the system, and we see that there's a, an increase in the, in the total peak demand. However, um, when we are able to control and to shift this demand to optimize it for when it's best for the system, not individual consumers uh, acting when it's best uh, for, their, for them individually, we see that an optimized profile would look very, very different and would provide uh, important benefits to, this, to the overall system uh, demand and, and supply. First of all, the use would be made coincident with renewable, so uh, it would enable to, to integrate a lot more uh, viable renewables in particular, wind and, and solar PV. Uh, it would also reduce the amount of ramping that is done by the conventional system. Um, and then it would also be an overall reduction in, in, in system peak demand, which would mean a lot less investment in, in electricity generation, in transmission, and in, in distribution capacity. So in the report, we highlight four key opportunities for this kind of integration uh, opportunities from the, from the demand and from the, from the supply side. The first one, uh, we see there are huge opportunities for so-called smart demand response through connected devices and appliances, the so-called Internet of Things. Uh, so we see also from these advanced scenarios, but also from more traditional ones, like, for example, a smarter heating system, flexibility from cooling and so on. So we estimate uh, out to 2040, 1 billion households and uh, with 11 billion connected appliances could add around 185 gigawatts of demand side flexibility, or about, uh, this result in $270 billion in avoided uh, electricity infrastructure investments. Infrastructure that would otherwise have to be built without this flexibility. We also looked uh, as a second opportunity at uh, the smart charging of electric vehicles. So given the high shares of electric vehicles that we see in our scenarios, how could this be integrated uh, at a lower cost to the system? Again, here, smart charging enabled by digital technology is important. What we see is that we ran two, two scenarios to cover a range of uh, uh, projections for, for EV uh, penetration. One scenario with 150 million electric vehicles and one with 500 million electric vehicles. Uh, and we compared how much uh, would the savings in terms of capacity, in terms of investment B, uh, in a scenario where we had traditional standard charging, consumers charge uh, according you know, only to their needs, and then smart charging, which is charging that's optimized to also benefit the whole system. And we see that overall, we estimate around $280 billion in our investment in a scenario with 500 million EVs over the medium term, 
which includes also generation, but also transmission and, and distribution infrastructure. There's also a, an additional benefit that I, that I mentioned that we also uh, highlight in the report, which is the ability for digitalization to help integrate higher shares of, of viable renewables by enabling grids to better match demand when the sun is shining, when the wind is blowing. Uh, so in this case, we estimate uh, for the EU that the curtailment of solar PV, uh, so spilling of uh, excess uh, generation, could be reduced from 7% uh, in, a, in a business as usual scenario to 1.6%, uh, just uh, below 2% uh, uh, in 2040, uh, which would result also in significant savings, 20 megatons of CO2. Finally, the last opportunity that we looked at um, is uh, digitalization enabling the integration of distributed energy resources. Uh, we've seen already uh, in previous uh, sections of, the present of this presentation how distributed energy is on the rise. As the cost of solar PV and batteries uh, continue to decline, the number of consumers that are producing, uh, storing their own energy uh, is set to increase. For example, in Germany, uh, over 2017, there were 50,000 uh, residential solar PV systems with storage in place, and half of those were installed in the previous year. So digitalization enables this in two main ways. First of all, uh, it enables, or it, it increases the capacity of grids to host distributed energy. So uh, there's a, with distributed energy, there's a lot more point sources of generation, uh, smaller sources of generation, the intelligence, the analytics, the controllability that's brought about by digitalization allows for system operators to better manage and control large numbers of these smaller assets within the systems. The second uh, way that it enables a higher share of distributed energy resources, it, it facilitates the exchange of locally produced energy uh, with the grid and within a local community. So for example, uh, technologies like blockchain, which are very much in the news, uh, they create a platform where energy can be traded without an intermediary. Uh, this is also called peer-to-peer -peer or transactive energy. Um, and in this case, while the potential is very, very significant and can be highly disrupted to the way electricity is produced, transported, and, and sold today, these solutions we see are pretty much in an early stage of deployment and how fast and how much uh, they could be deployed uh, remains highly uncertain. Thanks very much, Luis. Um, so we, we've heard a lot about uh, all the opportunities um, in improved efficiencies, uh, reducing costs, safety, and so on. Um, but before we get into the next section on, on some of the risks and barriers that we might see to achieving these, uh, these benefits, um, we have another poll question for you. Um, let me just uh, launch the poll. Uh, the question is, what will be the biggest barrier to achieving the benefits of digitalization? Um, and you have five options here. Uh, data ownership and data privacy, uh, cybersecurity, economic disruption and transformation. So these are impacts to, to people losing jobs, um, changing skill sets. Uh, is it market design challenges um, or lack of public acceptance and trust with new technologies? So I'll give you all a few seconds to uh, to respond, and then I'll show the results. All right, it looks like most of you have responded. Um, let me just share the results here. Um, so the clear leader is market design challenges at 43%. Um, second is lack of public acceptance and trust with new technologies. Uh, we have cybersecurity at 18%. So to talk about cybersecurity and energy security, which is a, um, a core uh, mandate for the IEA, um, my, my colleague, Jan Bartos from our security division will, uh, will take the floor now.
Okay. Uh, thank you, George. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Jan. Uh, and uh, I will talk to you a little bit about uh, digital resilience, which is uh, mentioned uh, as uh, one of the important parts of, of our report and, of course, a very, very important uh, topic to the IEA. As uh, some of you might know, that uh, the agency has been established as, a, as an energy security agency in the 70s. So, uh, well, uh, just to put this a little bit into context, uh, to date, it's important to say that cyber disruptions to energy have happened, but they have been relatively small when you compare them, for example, to, to national disasters, to hurricanes, or even to geopolitical risks that are uh, we, we can see uh, daily on the news, uh, sometimes uh, affecting our secure supply of, for example, oil or, or, or natural gas. Um, uh, and also one other thing that needs to be mentioned is that uh, digital resilience is not about uh, cyber attacks only, uh, but it can be also about uh, unintended cyber incidents, so malfunctions and so on, uh, or maybe even uh, natural causes. So with the massive increase of digitalization in, in uh, all aspects of our daily lives, um, we would of course be much more affected, for example, by a geomagnetic storm from 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 outer space from uh, from the sun uh, so uh, our report uh, does have a catalog of um, of attacks uh, which have happened to date uh, with uh, impact on energy systems some of these have been attacks on energy production and delivery infrastructure others on the business systems of energy companies uh, it's important to say that uh, cyber attacks are becoming easier and cheaper. Uh, uh, we read every day about uh, malware, ransomware, phishing attacks, and, and so on, uh, whaling and buffets, all these different techniques, how uh, hackers are getting through to uh, different networks or uh, uh, into, into people's accounts uh, or into um, critical infrastructure. Uh, so um, as we see, uh, billions more connected devices. Digitalization is increasingly uh, uh, expanding the, the so-called uh, cyber attack surface uh, of energy systems, uh, creating uh, many more points of attack and making it much more uh, sort of almost a democratic or uh, uh, or uh, lower cost to 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 cause attacks uh, to cause damage. Um, and uh, although full prevention is not possible. Uh, there's a variety of measures that can limit the impact and help preparedness uh, to rapidly handle and recover from attacks when they happen. So bigger events might require more coordination among companies and the, the governments, of course. And uh, our report does include a catalog of uh, best practices uh, with examples from around the world on, uh, on, on how to do this. Um, so we have a little example here of uh, one of uh, one of the major attacks that have been reported uh, that uh, occurred on uh, on an energy system uh, in Ukraine in December 2016. Uh, this is not to be confused with uh, another attack, which is maybe uh, more widely known, which also happened in Ukraine uh, a year before this one. Uh, but this one is uh, maybe more significant from the point of view of, of, of cybersecurity. Uh, the, brief but very significant attack on the electricity system uh, and it is thought that this has been a sort of a test run for malware called uh, by some in destroyer and in some other reports you can read the name crash override uh, which is a very versatile malware which enables uh, the attackers to uh, to uh, see, to block, to control, or even to destroy uh, the grid control equipment, uh, but also the equipment on, on the, uh, such as circuit breakers. It can cause overheating of the circuit breakers, so it can cause physical damage to the infrastructure. And this is uh, designed in such a way that it really requires very expert knowledge of um, several standardized communication protocols, which are widely used. Uh, to control the infrastructure. So not just electricity grids, but it could be used uh, for um, many other types of, of critical infrastructure uh, throughout Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. 
so this is one example, but we uh, are aware of many more. Just recently, there was information about a uh, uh, similar type of, uh, of attack uh, caused by malware called Trisis, which, uh, which attacked an oil processing facility in the Middle East. So this is an example of um, different types of energy systems that can be uh, affected. And uh, this uh, Trisis attack actually caused uh, an entire shutdown of this oil processing facility. Uh, and it turns out that uh, it was only by, by, by chance that it didn't cause physical damage and only caused a shutdown of, of the facility for, for a certain time. Uh, so uh, how can we be prepared? Uh, uh, of course, the most important, uh, and it was already mentioned, is uh, raising awareness uh, about these issues <coughs> among uh, all the different stakeholders, companies, governments, international organizations. And uh, this is also where we see uh, sort of a perfect role for us, for the IEA, uh, to help people uh, raise the awareness about all the issues, um, to communicate, to share best practices, uh, to maintain proper cyber hygiene. This is also very important uh, uh, to spread uh, the good practices of, um, of uh, updating your systems, of maintaining secure systems, good passwords, changing passwords, not keeping default passwords in, uh, in devices and, and so on. Uh, mainstreaming uh, security into design. This means uh, having, having devices uh, uh, or having having research already take into consideration that uh, uh, the devices need to be secure from the onset and not just patched, uh, uh, exposed, and so on. Well, also for preparedness, of course, it's very important to uh, hold exercises. Uh, so many countries are already doing that. Uh, even uh, cross-country exercises, we have examples of uh, GRIDX exercise in North America or uh, the EU Agency for uh, Network and Information Security, ENISA, is organizing cross-European exercises. So this is something that's already going on. And there's also one important aspect uh, which uh, needs to be mentioned. Uh, there needs to be uh, uh, good... Um, a good distribution or good clarity on uh, on roles and uh, responsibilities. Of course, uh, there are some types of attacks that uh, small businesses and individual users should be able to cope with. And then, of course, there are massive attacks where uh, you have uh, very well organized criminal groups or uh, or even nation states um, attacking the most critical infrastructure. And the, in these cases, of course, uh, there should also be the role of, of governments to, to be involved. Okay, so now uh, moving on a little bit to uh, to privacy, which was another issue uh, mentioned in uh, in George's poll just before my presentation. Uh, digitalization enables the collection of all kinds of real time data. Uh, so, for example, if you take a smart meter that collects data on uh, energy use in um, in a normal home. Uh, we can begin to see how data on electricity demand patterns to, to see what the household might be doing. So imagine uh, all the additional kinds of data that digitalization can capture. For instance, smart fridges tracking everything you eat, anonymous vehicles tracking everywhere you go, uh, and so on. So while this data in the wrong hands can compromise privacy and even pose a safety risk, it's also key to improve the understanding of energy systems such as load profiles, that can help lower costs for consumers and enable smart demand response and help achieve overall system efficiencies. So policymakers will need to figure out uh, systems, how to reduce privacy concerns and achieve these other objectives, including by aggregating and anonymizing individual energy use data. Sorry. So, uh, more broadly, digitalization raises another concern, concern that uh, gets a lot of attention, uh, which is well beyond the energy sector. That is economic disruption and especially the impact of automation and AI on jobs and skills. Uh, and there's a variety of organizations analyzing these broader economic dynamics, including the OECD. Uh, and our report highlights how these broader forces may impact jobs and skills uh, requirements in specific energy sectors. 
and thanks. This is all from me for now. Thanks very much, Jan. Um, so we're just going to conclude with uh, some no regrets policy recommendations, which are found in the, the final chapter of the report. Uh, before I get to that, I just want to alert you that there will be a, a short Q&A after this um, and with all the experts in the room, um, so feel free to start sending us your questions um, and we'll, we'll start uh, answering them right after, uh, right after this. So the report includes uh, 10 no regrets policy recommendations for governments around the world to consider. Um, these are recommendations that can be implemented now in order for governments to prepare for the future, even in the face of uncertainty and unknowns. So you can uh, refer to the report for more uh, details on each of these 10, but I'm just going to highlight a couple here. Um, so the first, um, governments need staff who can understand emerging technologies and trends and have the expertise to craft and tailor um, appropriate policies uh, for three and four. Um, three, given the complexity of technology, human behavior, the marketplace, and policies all interacting in a very dynamic environment, policies makers should uh, build flexibility into their systems. This is especially important with such rapidly changing technologies. And on four, which is quite related, experimentation is key, as it's very difficult to predict in, in the abstract how policies and incentive structures will play out. Uh, California offers good examples of this kind of real-world experimentation. Number seven, especially given the exponential growth in data and network use and all the connected devices coming online, it will be very important to continue monitoring their energy use very closely. To ensure that efficiency gains can continue to counteract energy growth of digital technologies, as well as the risk of rebound effects in buildings and transport, for instance. And on eight, again, we need to highlight the importance of bu building in digital resilience to help minimize the impact of cyber attacks. And finally, we also need to continue learning from each other. The report of, is full of positive case studies and cautionary tales. And while each government, jurisdiction, and economy is different, there are commonalities and lots we can learn from each other. This will be even more important going forward. So some concluding thoughts. Um, so one of the key questions we, we thought to answer um, in this report was whether the energy system was on the cusp of a new digital era. Uh, through our analysis, we, we, we would say that this, this is a yes. We've, we find that energy systems are in, in a new era uh, with digitalization. Uh, second, our hope is that our analysis will help shine a light on digitalization's potential, but also its challenges. Um, you can find our full findings uh, in the 185-page report online at iea.org slash digital, um, as well as an online interactive page that we've built for this report. And let me turn it over to Dave uh, to talk about um, kind of the, the interesting areas in digitalization and the next steps for IEA. So thanks, George, and thanks to all our excellent uh, presenters for this webinar. Hopefully all of you have found it as uh, informative and helpful as certainly I have and uh, a lot of our other stakeholders uh, around the world. So as George mentioned, um, this really is a springboard for future work from our end and for others. The digitalization and energy intersections are only going to increase in time and um, further analysis, especially the kind of rigorous analysis we do at the IEA side of things is absolutely critical going forward. It's also very useful to um, highlight the fact that we're not just talking about technology, but it's really the intersection of technology policy and human behavior when it comes to digitalization and energy. And so we'll be spending a good bit of effort on our own um, to really try to dissect how those three um, important characteristics swirl together. Um, in terms of next steps for IEA, there's a number of existing um, or planned efforts that we have underway, especially to really focus on those areas of digitalization and energy. And we presented on several of them today that are both high impact, that is, could be quite transformative to energy sectors or the systems as a whole, and high uncertainty. We heard about some of the estimates on what auto, uh, automation, electrification, 
and shared mobility may mean for the passenger vehicle side? How do we get those uncertainties down so that planners can, uh, can go forward accordingly? So a few specific areas. Um, one is on the automation, connectivity, and electrification of transport. We've got an ongoing work stream, George, and others are very much focused on that from um, the IEA side of things. We're also focused on digitalization, electricity, and smart energy systems. You heard from Lewis and others about um, the transformative impact that digitalization is having in the electricity side from Brent as well. This is an area that's only going to um, be more and more interesting, if you will, and and require more and more rigorous analysis. So this is another area that we're focused on, including with the WIO in 2018 having an electricity focus, which will uh, which will be a, a big deal and, a, and a hopefully useful for a variety of folks out there. So that ends the uh, the webinar, um, the presentation part of this webinar, and now we're going to uh, take some question and answers. So over to you, George, to moderate that part of it. But again, thanks for everyone's attention. And for those of you who participated in meetings and workshops with us, um, thank you for your input. Thank you for your guidance. And we look forward to continued collaboration and partnership going, going forward. Over to you, George. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions rolling in. Um, more basic questions we can answer right now. Um, a couple questions on whether the presentation will be made available um, and access to the report. So this uh, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube um, in a couple days, so be on the lookout for that. Um, I think you'll um, we'll be able to email out that link to to you all. Um, and then whether uh, whether access to the report is possible, yes, um, the report is free um, and available for download at iea.org/digital. Um, so, so we all encourage you to to read that um, and uh, send us your questions as well. Um, we have a qu we have a question on on transport. Um, you mentioned that uh, road transport energy use could uh, double or halve in the U.S. Why is there so much uncertainty? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, one useful way to conceptualize uh, the reason uh, for this uncertainty is to slice up uh, some of the uncertainty we have about the future into two dimensions, one being technology and costs, and the other one being behavior and policy. Um, so focusing first on the technology and cost side, current demonstrations and uh, research and development with automated vehicles relies on LiDAR sensors. You might have seen uh, some, some vehicles driving around with these sensors if you live in a place like San Francisco or Silicon Valley or Pittsburgh or Boston or even Phoenix, Arizona. Um, these sensors are currently quite expensive, but as we've heard, uh, sensors since 2010 in more broadly have come down in cost. Uh, I believe the figure uh, cited by one of my colleagues was 90%. So there are reasons to expect that the cost of these centers, sensors as well will, will continue to go down. Um, the processing that's required for the predictive models and the machine learning on the uh, artificial intelligence side uh, is also quite power uh, intensive. Um, that might have implications for whether the processing is done in the vehicle, uh, essentially, uh, Computers on, on automated vehicles right now require their own dedicated uh, water cooling and quite a bit of space. Uh, it's quite feasible that the, the size of the computers, if the processing were to be on board, could be brought down to the size of something like a glove box, or that uh, the processing could be done on the cloud. Um, but this is another technical challenge where kind of the rate of improvement, as well as uh, on machine learning algorithms themselves and, and, and deep learning, these are, these are areas where the speed of development is quite uncertain and the cost reductions that we might see in the future are also uncertain. Nevertheless, given the massive investments by various auto and technology companies, even startups in these spaces, uh, many analysts have estimated that, that, that costs per kilometer, say, of driving could come down substantially. And then the question becomes, how will people react to uh, fleet-owned vehicles that are very cheap to hail, very convenient to use? 
Uh, you can easily, easily imagine that if your commute is freed up and you're able to sleep or work or watch movies or just kind of uh, gaze out of your car window, you might value uh, uh, that time quite a bit more than having to drive. Uh, cheaper or easier still if you're able to just hail a, a shared vehicle uh, that you don't own. Uh, you might even decide to live further outside of a city. Um, you wouldn't have to leave your office necessarily to have your kids brought home from school, for instance. So there are lots of new um, scenarios that are opened up by this technology. Um, there's a role that should be played by policymakers uh, in regulating how, how these vehicles are used. Um, there are potential synergies with electric vehicles. Uh, central, uh, electric vehicle technologies tend to cost quite a bit more, but since fleets would be operating quite a, more, quite a bit more intensively, uh, this might help the cost competitiveness of electric vehicles vis-a-vis -vis conventional ICE vehicles. All of these kind of things um, are going to play out differently in different regions of the world, depending on uh, different geographic factors, population density of cities, cultural factors, and how people decide to regulate uh, uh, varying levels of increasing uh, vehicle uh, automation. So there are quite a few question marks, but we hope here to offer some policy advice about how to narrow this uncertainty and, and how to gauge how uh, these transformations could work toward the benefit of energy and climate goals. Thanks very much, Jacob. Uh, we have a couple of questions on, on buildings, so there's an interesting one here. Uh, do you see any game changers from digitalization in buildings? Uh, maybe TiVo can take that. Despite positive development in terms of energy efficiency deployment, buildings are still currently underperforming, and there are multiple reasons for that, one of which is the lack of basic energy data. So apart from large-scale impact on grid investments already mentioned by my colleagues, one game-changer brought by digitalization that I see might be to shed light on real energy needs, panel consumption, appliance ownership, etc., in areas where little data was available. Digital information can also relate to occupant behavior, choices, and energy patterns. All of these new pieces of information could be used either to implement a regular, let's say, non-digital energy efficiency program or policy, or to improve demand-side response mechanisms themselves. Besides the IEA Technology Collaboration Program on Energy Buildings and Communities, the EBCTCP, has recently embarked a research project looking at how real-time sensors and controls could be used for the development of energy use reduction strategies. So this is main game changer I see. Thanks, Thibaut. Um, if, if I, we have a couple more minutes left, so feel free to, to keep sending us your questions, and, and if we can't get to them, we'll, we'll try to answer them by email as well. Um, we have another question, uh, this time on the, the power sector. Uh, regarding those red, green, and blue benefits, um, do they vary from project to project? Um, is there a way to standardize, is there a standardized way to assess those benefits per project? Brent? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, George. And thanks very much for the question. Um, I think, so I showed the overall system impacts and kind of larger uh, estimated, estimated benefits. Uh, and I mentioned along the way, this is an accumulation of project level benefits, of course. So um, that will be all the way from the project design itself um, as I mentioned, for, for wind parks, um, but you can imagine benefits also for the, for the development and design of thermal power plants. In particular, though, it's really, uh, you can see on a project level for a project built today, the impact on the, the economics for the plant are going to be on the, the parameters through its lifetime. So with digital technologies and digital sensors, um, that predictive maintenance would enable you to slow down some of the losses that happen in power plant ages, for example. So you may, the efficiency losses in, in thermal power plants as they go forward, they become less efficient, generally because elements and, and uh, components become stressed and strained. That performance would be much uh, more consistent. And so that you could estimate uh, the impact on the fuel costs and the overall CO2 emissions, for example, um, and also the reduced operation and maintenance, you could expect those to be reduced significantly, again, through that predictive maintenance. 
ultimately leading to longer lifetimes, so affecting the number of years you, you need uh, in order to recover the invested capital. So, I mean, uh, at an individual project level, I think it would be quite clear exactly what those percentages are is a bit uncertain. Um, and that was that was some of our, our effort as well as to collect uh, a realistic range of what those impacts might be. But of course, these technologies are new. And so the benefits over 30, 40, 50 years uh, is also uncertain uh, and could be higher than those we estimated um, uh, as well. So, uh, but yeah, certainly all of these are at the project level, these benefits. Thanks very much, Brent. Um, so we've had questions on a, a couple different sectors. Um, we have one on industry now. Um, what are your view on views on the prospects of uh, 3D printing deployment? Kira can take this one. Thanks, George. Thanks for the question. Um, we we looked at one example uh, of one of the applications um, where we could see some future deployment of 3D printing in the manufacturing sector. Uh, but more generally, 3D printing has a couple of advantages compared with conventional manufacturing techniques. Uh, some of those include a reduction in the lead time before, before production output. Um, there could be reduced uh, material requirements re by reducing uh, material losses in the manufacturing process. Uh, you could see a reduced floor area footprint within an industrial facility, um, or, and, and most importantly, I think, the ability to manufacture pieces with more complex uh, shapes and geometries than, than what we're currently able to produce cost-effectively. Um, but the comparative advantage of 3D printing compared to conventional techniques has to be sort of assessed on a case-by-case -case basis for different products and in different sectors. Um, and we really need more information on the life cycle impacts of, um, of different production routes. So, so far, there's been some early adopters of 3D printing, um, and the sectors where this has been deployed uh, sort of early on have been in high-value applications, um, particularly in the aerospace and medical sectors, where you see high production costs and low throughput rates. Um, and those are, those are some cases where the ability to manufacture complex um, pieces with, with complex geometries can sort of offset the, the higher production of 3D printing. That said, uh, in the future, as um, the technology improves um, with sort of learning by doing, we could see 3D printing technologies become less costly, um, more efficient, and um, could be, they could be then introduced in other manufacturing sectors that have narrow econo narrower economic margins and that need to see greater production volumes. So because we're, we're not, um, don't have a view of exactly how that technology learning will progress, um, as, as my colleague mentioned earlier, there's quite a bit of uncertainty around the energy impact uh, that we would see from 3D printing, but certainly there's a, there's a large scope to broaden the application of 3D printing technology in the industrial sector. Thanks, Kira. Um, so we're we're basically out of time now. So um, any remaining questions, we'll we'll get back to you by email. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today for the webinar. Um, as I mentioned, you can find the report available for free online at iea.org/digital. Um, feel free to send us more questions. Um, our email address is digital at iea.org. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, uh, the webinar today will be posted on YouTube uh, shortly. So please be on the lookout for that. And with that, thank you very much. And thank you to all the, the speakers who joined us today.